do you have one, Tim? Do you do you plan your project in advance, or is it like ad hoc uh, as you go? Um, I have, I do have like a mental list of stuff I'd like to do, but nothing's ever really planned. No, um, it, it's like even even assembling the lathe the other week. I just I was in there and just ended up putting the lathe together. Which <laughs> <laughs> there were no sort of oh, I'm going to go in there and put my lathe together. But basically, uh, one of my one of my best mates he ended up with the oh the lathe that uh, I sent the link to you, Glenn. Right. Uh, the one he he got that off a, a customer. He's a gardener as well, and um, one of his customers' neighbours died and had a shed full of tools. And he was like, oh, will you come up and give us a lift with this lathe? So he's been turning just turning balls. He was like, I'm just going to make a load of balls to give out at Christmas. And that's obviously got in my head, and like cogs whirring. And then I'm at next time, next time I'm in garage, I'm assembling my lathe. I just sort of I'm no real plan into it. Just put it all together, and it's just been together ever since. Um, <laughs> but I, the, I think everyone's got that sort of mental list of what they're doing. That it just depends how uh, organised you are, and if you actually write stuff down. Which I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Are you one of those people that can have multiple projects running at the same time? Or yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I do. I went through a patch of doing that, and it did feel really productive. But uh, I just uh, once they're all finished, I never really continued with it. And then it's again you run out of space, and you've uh, now I've got one of the lathes all together. I've, I haven't got room to do anything apart from wood turning, and I can just about cut a blank on the bandsaw. Um, sharpen my tools and run the lathe. That's about it, really. I, I can't even reach my chop saw anymore. It's gosh. I'll put my table saw to up. Uh, luckily, it's a folding table saw, <laughs> as you well know. Yeah, they're quite handy, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, it's really. I, I didn't think I'd ever use that feature, but I've, I've used it loads. And like, you just have like so much more room when your table saw's up there. I, actually, I keep, I do keep mine up all the time, but it, it's such a nice light table saw. It's handy for moving around. Yeah, and the uh, the sliding panel bit's great, isn't it? I, I, I'm chuffed a bit yeah. with that part. Have you made a sled for yours yet? No, I've not really needed to. I, it, it, sort of, sort of, I have had them on uh, my old table saw, yeah. but then I never knew what to do with the sled. It was just kicking about, and it right. would just get dropped, and it would be out of square and just nowhere to keep it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because the, because the, um, the, the evolution saw's got the sliding compound table, you can uh, put a little uh, like lug nut if you like on the sled which when you pull the, the sled towards you the compound table actually supports it so it never tilts away it's fantastic a really good feature for that yeah I say I very rarely use my compound saw now I do most of my cuts like that on the sled ah right okay I just I didn't know how accurate the um, the actual might uh, what they called the is it a mighty gauge? Yeah, yeah. Adjust your bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I didn't know how accurate that would be, but I've, it seems it seems good. Yeah, right. Uh, I've got no. I, I've used it just to have a bit of a fuck about with it, basically, and that's uh, that's yeah. it. I've, uh, I, I just because like working on site, it were always chop saws, so I, that's the first thing I think of. Just if I need to cut something, it's just chop saw. Right. And then obviously you're trying to like. Rip, rip the longest board you can in a, in a chop saw, just because it's easier than getting a table saw out. <laughs> you know, like you're, you're lifting boards up while you chop them and stuff, uh, and then yeah, accidents happen. Yeah. But yeah, I need to, I need to get into the mindset of using the table saw more definitely. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I early on when I established my workshop, I, I built a table with an integrated, uh, of course, table saw, and then. I also made a, a decent sled for it, but I never got around to make the grooves in the tabletop so I can push it all the way. Yeah. And then I n- never basically had the use for it. And now I also got the track saw. <laughs> so <laughs> it's easier just to pull that out. So the I'm not racking that much hour on the table saw, but when I need it, it's really nice. But it's mostly in the summertime when I can wheel it outside and I need to cut lengths and lengths of plywood or something yeah as you say like the the track saws are amazing aren't they? my only issue with the track saw is having somewhere to actually put the material while you're cutting it 
So a lot of the time yeah. I have to put my table saw away, then get saw horses out because my all my workbenches are just <laughs> covered in shit. And um, you just think, oh, I just could just get the table saw out. <laughs> <laughs> That's one tool, nice. yeah. one tool I'd like to add to my, my collection is a, um, a track saw, but just for the sheet goods. They're a bit problematic to break down, aren't they, when they're a full sheet? Yeah. That, that's how I ended up with, um, it was just a McAllister one from B&Q, they were selling them off for ah, okay. 45 quid or something. Right. So I thought, well, you can't lose one. And um, I, I've been using that one right up until when Triton sent me their tracks off for the right. build-off, because at the end of the build-off they just went, oh, we want to send you something for running the build-off, and it were a track saw, which... I haven't got it out of the box yet because I've just been playing with my live. Right. <laughs> I, think, I think the Triton ones are actually pretty decent, aren't they? Yeah, it's, um, I've heard I've heard good things about it. Yeah, um, I can't I can't fault that McAllister one. To be fair, it's it's yeah. been as good as you'd expect, really, and it, right. it's been through hell. Like I've, all the safeties have been snapped off it. Um, it's got no kickback features at all now. It's just basically. <laughs> No, it's a feature. I've had to like lock it off to cut at ninety degrees because the fo- the angle in it just won't work it anymore. It's all just bolted right. rigid <laughs> just to do one job. So my my we'll see first how the one puts up with yeah. it. My first circular saw was a uh, McAllister, and that fucking thing exploded on me. I don't know what the hell was going on. I was just cutting a piece of wood, not doing anything stupid, and the blade and the guard got tangled up and just shattered. Cut. Ah, wow. Yeah, cut my hand. That's fun. <laughs> Made my poo my pants. <laughs> <laughs> my um, my first table saw did something similar. I was it was summertime and I had the garage door open, and my my garage isn't like hardwired into the electrics. It's just on an extension. Cause, <laughs> you know, an why would I? Why would I do that? <laughs> 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 and, um, and I was cutting something, and the the blade fell, hit the um, metal insert plate. Uh, and it was just starting to cut through itself, the saw. So I just like, ran into the kitchen, unplugged it, and then the motor and drive assembly had unbolted itself off the table saw and was just cutting through the own, its own tabletop. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, luckily, um, one of the Shupach main dealers is like three miles from my house, so I just drove it down there, waited 20 minutes, they fixed it, put it back in the car, brought it on, carried on. It was great. It's really handy. <laughs> they didn't even ask how nice. what had happened. <laughs> I think what's more astounding is it didn't put you off using it. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's why you keep your hands out of the way, isn't it? Just in case yeah. these things do happen. But I think I heard the other day, and I don't know if it's on the world basis or if this was just in the States, but anyhow, it's a large number, but it's, it is like 30,000 table saw incidents every year that's a huge yeah, number I think I've heard that. yeah it's a lot and it? i'm i'm terrified every time i'm using it I'm, I'm standing to the side i don't want to get anywhere close to it uh but yeah people are still getting hurt <laughs> well, it's like everyone with these saw stops and they think they're super safe and stuff but like kick you can still kick back can it yeah yeah like, and i mean if they also now that I know they also uh, screw themselves loose and chase you, then of course I can understand the numbers are kind of high. Yeah, that's, but the biggest safety thing is have your garage run off an extension into the kitchen, otherwise uh, you, there's nowhere to run, is there? <laughs> I keep mine, keep mine safely tethered to the wall next to it. Can't run as far then, can it? <laughs> You're looking forward to getting your table saw up and running, KJ, after all these stories? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really eager, it feels, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't really used it uh, since I got it, but then again, it's a lot of the time it's been winter time as well, and as I said before, I try to do all the dusty work outside because I don't want the, the team version of the workshop with sawdust everywhere. I think I, uh, my dad... His uh, workshop in the basement is that's like two millimeters of wood dust everywhere, God. and I think growing up with that, you get some, you get allergic to it, so to say. 
think that's one of the main benefits of filming in the workshop actually for me I clean my workshop probably three or four times a week <laughs> a week yeah, that... a week yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah I don't think I've cleaned my workshop three or four times since I've had it <laughs> Well, I think you, you, it's quite funny when you do it, Tim, because you put it on Instagram so everybody knows the last time you did it. I think it was about July, August, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, probably. Oh, I yeah. thought that was another one of the volcanoes on Iceland, but it was Tim. Okay. <laughs> I just remember the sky went black over at the uh, west, so... No planes in the air. <laughs> we have a dust cloud moving over the British Isles. I think all you achieved was a slightly cleaner floor and you found a few more tools, didn't you? Yeah, that's it. It's it's just <laughs> cheaper than going shopping for tools, yeah. Just to find what's <laughs> what's in, in the in the dust under the table saw, yeah. <laughs> oh dear. It's definitely due another one. Yeah, it will be from all that lading. That's one of the things that's put me off getting one to be fair. They are it's a really messy thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and what you can you make it, not... basically? Say again, Havard? Yeah, that, that's the one thing, all the dust and shavings they make, but what can you make? I mean, you can only make so many table legs, and of course there is the odd uh, fruit bowl, but that's about it. And I mean, and these are the, whenever someone talks about a lathe, I'm thinking about this 70s table legs with uh, the balls and the tapered and uh, all the intricate shavings it, it really never interested me to try one and then a friend of mine sent me a video of someone turning um, whiskey tumblers and then charring them on the inside so you had like oak whiskey tumblers and like for half a second that's a neat idea yeah. no. it's, 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 it, that, that's not even enough to make me get one <laughs> I don't know I'm tempted now where's your mate live <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Laid was actually one of the things in the really early days of my making career. Uh, when I was, I think, six or seven years old, I saw uh, saw it on on TV and thought, "Man, this looks awesome!" I mean, it looks like magic when you're turning. So I got in my head, "Ooh, I want to try this." Uh, so I, so I, I don't. Uh, go someplace where they have it so I can try it out uh, get in touch with my uncle who I had, had a big or has a big uh, wood, wood, wood shop no I decided to save money to buy one myself yeah that's the maker way I mean you don't yeah, consult so, you so just after, buy <laughs> yeah so after two years I've saved up uh, about like 150 quid and this was in the late 80s early 90s and then the NES Nintendo system got out, so I bought that <laughs> instead. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah well, I totally if, forgot about woodworking for like ten years. <laughs> yeah, if you if you still got the uh, well, if you still have that one on the original box, you can get a pretty decent lathe. Yeah, but it's still the mess. And uh, I mean, the, the only time of time I used the lathe was in wood wood shop class, what it's called, at school. And we were distinctly told that you're not allowed to do to make baseball bats. So I made a candle holder that's about 60, 70 centimeters long. <laughs> with a very, very grip-friendly uh, top piece and goes out pretty wide uh, in the end. That yeah. was okay, apparently. Oh, that brought back memories. I mean, we, we played a lot with... Uh, various games uh, using bats and of course we, we made them out of uh, two by fours and you twiddled them down and of course there was this one kid who had a father who had a lathe and we really wanted that bat but <laughs> yeah <laughs> so maybe that's but now you can get bats and I want a metal lathe so I can make an aluminum one yeah Maybe that's you a two-for-one. Turn aluminium on a wood lathe. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you just use the regular wood chisels, turning chisels? Yeah, it's it's like a bandsaw, isn't it? You can cut aluminium uh, on a wood bandsaw. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just just off that theory, I assume you'd be fine, yeah. 
<laughs> Works for me. Seems pretty sound. <laughs> oh no, you just uh, get an evolution lathe and you can cut anything on it. Absolutely. They don't make a lathe yet, do they? That's a shame. No. <laughs> I'll have a word. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> I did try to do brass on mine because um, I wanted to make an ice pick, but then I realised my uh, tail stock doesn't line up at all with the chuck, so I don't know if I've bolted the bed on wonky or something, but I need to address that because otherwise I'm never going to turn anything other than balls. Because I was going to say that, I, I, isn't that one of the major premises for lathe? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's a major issue, yeah. I, uh, I'm pretty sure I can fix it, but I think it's just not a... a is it 90 degrees to the chuck? Something like that. It's not It's not on right. Something's up. What's the deal with ice picks? I don't get it. I don't understand why it's such a useful tool. No, I didn't. That's why I wanted to make one to see uh, <laughs> if I'd use it. Because I, I don't want to pay 125 quid for one either. I, I worth a much better. <laughs> How much is a Duresta ice pick? I think, I think there's, there's something like that, aren't there? There must be 100 quid. Are they really? Yeah, I think so. And it's like 80 quid for the smaller ones. Gosh. But then again, I I bought, I, I think that was two quid uh, at a local hardware store where you had like a set of five with like a, a straight and uh, various angles, like uh, picking tools. And it's basically five of the same for next to nothing. And I use them all the time, but mainly to clean out the grooves uh, after the CNC run, but uh, you know, I don't think I could really see me using an ice pick very often. Not to defend that price. <laughs> you thought about getting any robots, Tim? Laser, three D printer, or CNC? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not against the idea. It's just space. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'd probably probably go for CNC or laser first. But then there's it's, you just get little ideas for stuff and you think, oh, I could 3D print that, but obviously I ain't got one, so I can't do it. Or, you know, I could uh, yeah. engrave this or do that. But I quite like doing the um, hand carving anyway, so I, I, that would probably take away from hand carving stuff, like a, like when I made the yeah. strap for my youngest lad. Um, but I, I love doing that. I want to do some more of that, actually, so that's another right. reason to put the lathe away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Did you make the uh, Dave Cullen thing? Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> did you make it specifically to look like him, or is it that thing off of the uh, the Muppets? <laughs> no, I was, I was just trying to make it. I've always had this thing about wanting to make a totem pole. Right. Like, even when I was a kid. I think it was, remember the cartoon Paw Paw Bears? Paw Bears? Like, uh, Paw Paw. No. And they were sort of like cartoon bears, but they like formed a totem pole. And ever yes. since then, I've been a little bit obsessed with totem poles. Um, it was sort of like Care Bear era, wasn't it, and Thundercats and stuff, but obviously I didn't catch on yeah. as well as everything else. Um, I've always liked totem poles, and I was just trying to make the top of a totem pole. I can't remember. Oh, it was, uh, I did it with the um, wood cutting bit in an angle grinder. Tool station made one for about six quid. I just bought oh, one of them. Okay. Because uh, I'm obviously Arbitec ones are a fortune, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it, uh, I finished it, and then I ended up talking to Dave Cullen about stuff, and I just realised it looked like him, so I just started putting stories <laughs> about it being him, and it's just caught on ever since. <laughs> but, yeah, I took it up to see him when I went to his workshop, he was absolutely chuffed to bits. <laughs> <laughs> then you left it rolling around in your van for a few months, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I completely <laughs> forgot we were in there. Uh, it's just in the garage now with one of his uh, one of his bobble hats on. <laughs> Is that just to keep the dust off? Yeah, <laughs> it just covers up some of the uh, the dirt off my uh, floor at the car. That that uh, totem story reminds me of a thing that I want to do, and you could do that with a totem as well. Um, that you make something and then you erect it in a place where nobody expects to find it and you just don't say anything and you just wait for the local news to pick up on it. So uh, the, the Norwegian phone booth is identical on all four sides and it's very plain, very easy to make in 
plywood or whatever. So I thought, all right, if I make the four sides, and that is easy enough to carry anywhere, if you just bring three mates, and then, of course, in the cover of the night, we can actually bring that anywhere, put it together, and then, of course, just leave again before anyone notices. But we haven't really figured out where should we put it to make the most impact. (laughs) (laughs) And, of course, you could put it on, like, a popular travel routes or something and of course but that would just be a short notice in a local newspaper we want to put it somewhere where people really start talking about it and i think putting a totem pole up in the middle of a roundabout or something would caught the attention yeah you want to put it up somewhere where it's hard to take it down but it's not in the way but people can see it yeah, I mean, because if it's easier to take it down, the council would do it in like five minutes. Yeah, that's the thing. And of course, it's made out of wood, so it, it, you really have to engineer it to make it hard. But I did think that, all right, you put it together with wood screws, and then you plug the holes with pegs, and then you just uh, use a Japanese pull saw to cut the plugs off. So then it's it's hard to see, and if you have like... A, a small picture of paint with you you can cover up uh, so they don't know where the screws are and of course if you bring an additional friend uh, a big one then you can carry one bag of uh, cement so you can actually mix it in place and you can really make it heavy and sturdy where it sits <laughs> so you can't just take it down without actually <laughs> planning on taking it down and bringing tools with you but there's a fine line between a funny prank and vandalism, so it's trying yeah. to not uh, overshoot that. This is that. called art. <laughs> yeah. Art. But yeah. if, you, if you put something like that up in Scandinavia, you'd all just pretend to be frogs and hop around it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, in Sweden, it would probably just uh, mark the beginning of a new holiday. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think if you could attach one to a weather balloon, if it would actually lift it. I just need a big enough balloon. <laughs> yeah. that, Problem is where it's going to land. <laughs> that that being said, my uh, my father uh, used to work as a radio officer on a diving vessel, and of course, they have tanks of tanks of hydro no um, of helium because they use it in the dive operations. So they actually teamed up with the uh, meteorological institute. So they got like a big bag of weather balloons and sensors and so on. So every other day they just sent up a balloon. And of course uh, they had a lot more balloons than equipment that needed to be sending up. So they just, what else can we put into the air? So <laughs> there's a lot of debris around the world, which is just based on uh, <laughs> what can a weather balloon lift? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds sounds like a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Can we lift this? <laughs> I was just thinking, like, like one day, like the diving vessel would just be like floating past Norway. <laughs> it just, <Yeah. laughs> it's just like, every weather balloon they've got attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> <laughs> Always wanted to be in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> What were you going to say, Glenn? Oh, I, was, uh, I had a fascination every time I got a helium bloom as, bloom as a kid, seeing what it could lift. And they can't lift a great deal, can they? They have to yeah, attach I, I know, toy soldiers and all sorts to them. <laughs> yeah, just the, the squeaky voice thing does it for me every time. It's great. Have you uh, had anything to do with SF6 gas at work, KJ? Uh, not that much. Uh, only checking on some switch gear that has it and it's apparently leaking out left right and center it feels like yeah it does that yeah but if you if you breathe a little bit of that in that does the opposite of helium and like makes your voice like really deep but also makes you drown so you've got to be careful how much you breathe in (laughs) yeah i've heard that it's not really good to play around with no it's a really bad idea but uh it's it's interesting (laughs) if like if you you have a fish tank of it and you fill the fish tank because it's denser than air you can like float a paper boat in in the SF6 gas. Wow. Cool. But as I said, it's just, it's not worth prattling about with because it, it will kill you if you do it, get it wrong. 
I think there is yeah. another gas who does that that's a bit safer. But yeah, still, I mean, if you take too much uh, helium, you will get dizzy because it does, I mean, suppress all the oxygen going to your lungs. So people have been <laughs> yeah. passing out, but then of course... They're yeah, but that escapes the normal way. I mean, you have yeah. to do a handstand or something to get that <laughs> yeah. one out. And that's yeah. pretty hard when you're unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's been... Uh, I, I remember... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was also popular for those who uh, had access to welding equipment, of course, uh, acetylene um, in balloons is also very fun. Um, yeah, bin bags of it, it's great. Yeah, but then uh, we had a few guys uh, in my town, They, I think they filled six relatively large balloons. Uh, I think this was in New Year's Eve, and of course they uh, they had to go to the city center to light them up there so they just chugged them in the car and got in and of course they were smoking and drinking not thinking much of it of course and then <laughs> those six balloons went off and it totaled the car and sent everyone to the hospital and it's like uh, hearing loss burning <laughs> blast shock <laughs> you name it that's that's a real nasty accident yeah, that's awful. Uh, have you seen the guys that fill the um, fifty-five gallon drums with uh, gas and then just light them with like a like a torch? I think I think it was Russian guys in a field somewhere, but they <laughs> yeah, like, it sounds it like it. Miles, it's impressive, but you don't want to be hit by an oil drum on the way down. But <laughs> there's a, another thing I used to do as a kid, and I think I'm safe doing this because I don't think my mum listens. That was, um, <laughs> But I used to get a uh, the biggest pan we had in the house, which I think was my mum's pressure cooker. Get my dad's lighter gas, squirt some of that in there and light it, and the boom used to shake all the windows in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try that at home, kids. <laughs> what else are you going to do growing up in Mansfield? <laughs> I think we can probably call the half pint there as well. Yeah, went out with a bang. <laughs> 